Hello, welcome to School Leader Up Close. I'm Janet Bamford. I'm the Chief Communications Officer at the New Jersey School Boards Association. And I am here today with Kurt Rabovich and Sandy Raup, who are two of our labor relations experts at NJSBA. Um, we are gonna talk a little bit about the winter issue of School Leader Magazine. And, uh, and Kurt and Sandy both have articles in this issue of the magazine talking about uh, different topics about labor relations. Um, and one of the most important jobs of any board of education is handling nego negotiating with its uh, employee unions. Um, this is the time of year when negotiations committees are in full swing. And NJSBA has a wealth of resources and information for boards of education uh, that are involved in negotiations. Um, and we're going to talk about some of that right now. Um, Sandy, let's start with you. Um, Sandy, as a data analyst, you do a lot of work that benefits boards as they are preparing to begin negotiations. Um, in your school leader piece, you talk about recent trends in um, settlements, in contract settlements among boards in the state. Um, one of the things we always look for, you mentioned that new teachers contracts that began with this school year, um, for those contracts, the average increase is 3.56% for this year. Um, so that's something that board members might want to take a look at in the issue. Um, but first, let's talk a little bit about why is it important for boards to have access to um, comparative data when they're getting ready to negotiate with the unions? What, why do they need it? Well, it's important to be prepared. Um, having access to comparative data helps the board understand what's occurring in, in state and settlements. So showing up for your first bargaining session, you should already have an idea what other settlements look like because you may not have been at the negotiating table for some time. Maybe it's been three years. Maybe this is your first time at the table. Um, but an important note is though, what other districts settle at should never be what dictates the board's goals, but rather be a tool that helps prove or disprove a claim. So for example, if a union claims the county average of their starting salaries is $61,000, but the board with access to that settlement data finds that most of the districts within that county may be large K-12 districts. They may even have a regional high school district. They could have a vacational district. Um, so special services, those districts are generally higher, higher in salary. Um, but when you filter down, and you're you're a small K to eight, so if you can filter down that data into something more meaningful that shows the size and grade configuration of your comparisons, um, you may actually find that the salary is more competitive among those comparables. Um, so the board needs to be able to present um, their own data, which is vitally important. Sandy. Are there other, you, you mentioned uh, salary trends in, mm -hmm. in your article. Are there other noteworthy trends that you've noticed that perhaps aren't mentioned in the school leader article? Yeah, there is, um, but I wouldn't consider it a good trend from the board's perspective. Uh, board achievements is dropping. And what I mean by a board achievement is any proposal or goal that the board was seeking to obtain in this round of negotiations and they were successful in doing so. Um, that is what we mean by a board achievement and that's been considerably dropping off. Um, for example, in, in 2015, districts that started with that contract year in 15, 78% of districts reported some type of a board achievement. Four years later in 1920, it dropped to 68%. And now this year, four years after that, in 23-24, only 46% of districts are reporting a board achievement. The, the point is negotiations is a two-way street, and it's not just about uh, you know, negotiating raises. The, it's also about achieving a contract that works for both parties. So if there's something important your new contract needs, if there's language um, in your contract that maybe has been presenting a lot of grievances from, um, maybe need some clarification or some word changes. Um, now's the time to seek that change. Sandy, for um, for members who may not be familiar with it, what what would examples of board achievements be when you say um, board achievement? The, the example of a board achievement would be um, you were seeking, say, 
scheduling flexibility and you, you were able actually to get that or you wanted an additional work day. Um, anything really that the board has set out to gain, to change, to you know, modify in that contract somehow and they were successful in doing so. We're just not seeing that much reported anymore and it's, it's a little concerning. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so when you're on a negotiating committee, the NJEA brings settlement reports and other data to the negotiating table. Why can't the board just use the data that is brought by um, by the uh, employees? Yeah, you know, I get asked that question a lot. And it's not that their settlement rates are vastly different from ours. Um, they're generally the same, but it's rather comes down to the comparisons they are making and from what data set. Are they broad-based comparisons? Um, you know, maybe they're citing the state or a county, or is it the opposite? And maybe it's a cherry-picked settlement that may be particularly high. Um, you want to ask to see their data. Uh, you want to look to see what districts they're making their comparisons against. Also, remember, it's the union's job to get a settlement in terms of conditions of employment that are favorable for their members. Um, so they're going to present data that's going to be in their position, right? So the board needs to do the same. And our report generally kind of makes it that much easier for the board <clears throat> to gather information, to help them make their own arguments and present their own research. So about a year ago, NJSBA introduced a new service, a fantastic new service uh, for members only. And we've gotten some great reviews on it, in effect, from our board members. Um, uh, and some terrific feedback called uh, the services negotiations data portal. And uh, Sandy was instrumental in uh, designing it and developing it. And I'm hoping she can tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. So the portal has been a fantastic tool um, regarding teacher settlements and teacher salaries. And um, can this tool be expanded? Yes. And I'm really hoping that we see it expand with more and more data, but in the, um, what we're looking at next is I often get asked for administrator salaries. Now we don't collect that personally, but we do receive a data set from the New Jersey Department of Education every year for administrator salaries. Um, and the problem with that is we have it, but they still have to come through me to get it. And so we're currently working on a similar report generating system like we have for the teachers where the members will have the same ability to select the parameters of their report and um, download it or print it. So the, the salaries would be for superintendents, business administrators, principals, assistant principals, supervisors, and directors. It'll be available in this new system. It will show degree level experience, um, how many years experience the administrator has, um, but we are in the very early stages of this. And so it was going to take a little bit of time, a little bit of testing, but we will certainly keep our members um, informed once this goes live. That sounds fantastic. Uh, it, that's a nice addition. Um, and I also, I want to point out to anybody watching that negotiation data portal is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You sign in using your members login and then you can ask, as Sandy um, mentioned earlier, you can ask for what you want the parameters of your search to be. Your county, neighboring counties, your grade schools, grade or districts, grade exactly. configuration, all, exactly. all those things. It's kind of infinite, infinitely um, uh, uh, adjustable. So, um, Kurt, we're gonna let's let's shift our focus to you. When Sandy put her article together, um, at that point, there were still about thirty-two percent of school districts with contracts that expired last June that hadn't reached an agreement yet, and we know that at least twenty-nine percent of those districts are at impasse and are now in or about to go to the mediation process. And that there are also districts with contracts that expired in June 22 that haven't reached a settlement yet, and they're going through impasse procedures. These are all terms that um, a negotiations committee, if you're new to a negotiations committee, or even if you just need a refresher, you may be unfamiliar with these concepts. So Kurt covers a lot of these in his uh, school leader article on negotiations basics. So let's start at the beginning, Kurt. 
why was the New Jersey Employer Employee Relations Act, which is called the PERC law, um, PERC standing for, well, you can tell us what PERC stands for, <laughs> uh, uh, why was that created? So uh, to start, and it is a mouthful, right, to say it. So we shortened it by saying the PERC law, which is the Public Employment Relations Associate uh, Commission. But the, the law in itself is because most of the contracts that are covered uh, affect public service. Think firefighters, police, school districts, which is what we cover. Um, so you don't want a disruption in those public services to the community at large. So the PERC law was enacted to help mitigate any labor issues uh, between management and the union and resolve them in a quick manner so that services to the public are not affected. So we understand that not everything is negotiable when you sit down and bargain with your district's unions. Um, what's the difference between items that are mandatorily negotiable and non-mandatorily negotiable? That's always a topic we get calls about uh, at school boards uh, to address. So if something is mandatorily negotiable, that means one of the sides, one of the parties, whether it's management or union, have brought it up as an issue that they want to negotiate and discuss during the negotiations process. Like Sandy mentioned uh, before, you know, if there's something that keeps getting a grievance filed against it within your collective bargaining agreement, typically the side that is bringing those grievances forward uh, will fought, will discuss about it uh, during the negotiations process. So if something is mandatory, mandatorily negotiable, that means one, the sides is going to bring it up and you have to negotiate it at the table. Things that are non-mandatorily negotiable are in law or statute. So that uh, covers pension payments, even uh, the allotted number of sick days, um, and even the number of school days in a year. You can always do better than the law, but there's there's a minimum threshold you have to meet if it's in statute or law. And and um, what are what's an example of some things that you must negotiate over if one side brings it up? Yeah, so a good example is uh, even school time, right? The the length of the day, which I know Sandy tracks for us also. Um, and, and that's important to note because we like to compare apples to apples. Um, if we have one district that's working an eight hour school day and another district that's working a seven hour school day, as an example, um, that affects their salaries and other benefits that the employees within those districts receive. So you need to break it down so that you're comparing apples to apples during the negotiations process. And if you didn't know these little um, these little issues or these little differences between districts, um, then you would think, wow, this one district's paying a lot more than the other. But really, it's because they're working a longer school day, as an example. So I just want to clarify one thing. Kurt had mentioned that we have, I track the length of the school day. Um, what I track is the length of the school year. So the number of days in the school year. But if you did want to look at other districts and how the length of their school day compares to yours, we do have a collection of contracts on our website. It's in the data portal area. You'll see teachers collective negotiation agreement. Um, click on that button and you'll find um, all the con teachers contracts that we have received. Now there may not be every single one there, but we do have more than even the PERC website, um, which is quite impressive um, because they're required to send their contract to PERC, but they're really not required to send it to us. So, but we do have quite a collection and there you can do much of your research from. Um, so what happens uh, if the union and the board can't come to an agreement, um, you know, either as a whole or on any specific issue, what what's the procedure? What's the process in that case? Yeah, so it's great. Um, we have a process in, in place. You file with PERC, uh, the commission, um, that you're at impasse and you can't come to an agreement. Now, you do have to demonstrate that you, uh, faith, you know, faithfully tried to uh, come to the negotiation table and work out the issue. Uh, typically it's about three meetings. Um, if after three meetings you cannot settle on a specific issue, 
uh, then you one party will file a perk that you're at an impasse and it starts a mediation process, which is essentially bringing in a third party to help negotiate between the two parties. I've actually personally been a part of uh, impasse procedures. And uh, the one thing I would love to tell everyone is uh, both sides do not get what they want. Uh, so if you can't come to an agreement with each other and you do want to bring in a third party, just keep in mind that uh, the whole purpose of that third party is just to get you settled. They don't care how much you're paying. They don't care how much you're giving away. Um, so you really have to be aware of that when you bring in a third party. Their only purpose is to get you to settle. And depending on where you are, where you are at in the process, uh, they can even keep you there 24 hours uh, in order to get the settlement done. And 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 the the steps go first. You're at impasse, then you go into and if that doesn't, then you go into mediation. Yeah, you go into mediation, um, and you know it, it, there's a lot uh, to talk about with that, uh, which we could talk about um, yeah. if anyone wants to go through. Uh, they're more than welcome to call us. However, um, there's public reports you have to put on the website. And the final process is called super conciliation, which um, only one or two districts have uh, gone through and they've never gone beyond that uh, because that's where you could be held for 24 hours straight, um, tiring yourself down, right? Your negotiations committee down just to get to a settlement. Around the clock. Around the clock. Um, and I know of stories back in the 90s where you used to negotiate at a, a neutral site, like a hotel or something like that. So. Um, there are costs involved in, in all of this um, to both sides, and it, it's a lengthy process. But again, what I always like to warn school districts about is if you are going to go to impasse, uh, keep in mind, you're not always going to get what you want either. So it may not be the best route to go. You may want to just take a breather, take a week off to uh, you know, gather your, your thoughts and then come back to the negotiations table and try to work it out between both parties, between union and management. Uh, cause that third party person is not from your district. They don't know your community. And again, their whole purpose is just to get this settled so that they could go home also. Well, that's, that's great. We could, we could probably spend, you know, a week talking about all these issues. Um, uh, but I want to thank you both for being here today. Where can our members find more information if they need it? So you can always contact us. Um, Sandy and I, we're always available. Our, our phone numbers are on our website. We also have um, a great legal and labor relations section of our website. Um, and we are in the process of redoing our website. So it's going to get even better. But uh, in the meantime, we do have a lot of information up on our website and we have a generic email uh, that you can also use on our website there that will go to all of us. And whoever grabs it first will respond to you. But uh, one of the most fruitful things for me, at least as an employee of New Jersey school boards, is just talking to school board members and chairs of negotiations committees um, to walk them through the process and hear how things are going. Of course, when you call us, everything is confidential. So we're not going to share anything you tell us with anyone um, you know, outside of NJSBA because we do want to give you the right information. So sometimes I'll say, you know what, I'll go talk to one of our attorneys and get back to you on that. Um, and then I would have to share that information with the attorney to create the scenario for them to understand what's fully happening. But we have a whole host of information on the website and uh, any of us, we are uh, very happy to speak to you. And then we have various webinars and conferences throughout the year. I know in the spring, we're gonna have a spring conference that's gonna help uh, us get some labor relations information out there. And then always in Atlantic City in October our, at workshop, our annual convention, um, we have wonderful labor relations programs. And hopefully this year we might do something special on Monday of workshop too, uh, that's really labor focused. Great, great. Well, thank you both. Thank you for watching, members, and I urge you to read the latest issue of School Leader Magazine.